Pepito, Finochal, Beber, La Couf, Caspipe, Griborn, Escatafig, Père Magloire, Le Baron, Alambic, and Fakir Karaboum were the nicknames we chose for ourselves. On our propellers, we had painted the French colors, red, white, and blue. We flew in our Soviet yak planes with pride. My name is Roland de la Poip, son of the Earl of Poip. The guys have decided to nickname me the Marquis as a joke. I'm going to tell you the extraordinary story of our group of friends. There were 20 of us, all with the same dream, to carry on the fight for a free France. And so General de Gaulle sent us to fight in the Soviet skies for our country. Hitler's pilots soon came to fear us, the French pilots with the red stars who destroyed 273 planes emblazoned with the swastika. But 44 of our team would never see their native France again. We were a squadron that became a legend, and our name was Normandy Neiman. In Moscow, they still speak of us with respect. 70 years have passed, but here they still call us the ambassadors of courage. Уважаю за то мужество и героизм летчиков французских. Но они знали, какая, какая война. Они знали, что они идут многие на гибель. Они знали, что если немец найдет их родственников, то их расстреляют немцы, уничтожат. Они знали, что их собьют, если их собьют, то их в плен не возьмут, их расстреляют немцы, потому что Гитлер издал указ. Приказ летчиков полка Нормандии Неман расстреливать без суда и следствия, как партизан. Но они шли. И аристократы, и простые смертные, простые летчики простые. За это как можно не уважать? General de Gaulle came up with the idea to suggest to the Soviets that a French fighter squadron should be sent to the Eastern Front. Together, we chose the name Normandy to baptize our squadron. It was a way for us to say that France was still fighting. Every one of us had escaped from Marshal Pétain's occupied France, and every one of us wanted to carry on fighting, for which we were all sentenced to death as traitors and deserters. On the 12th of November, 1942, 14 of us pilots flew to Baghdad, accompanied by our mechanics and interpreters. Then we took the train to Tehran, our last stop before the great adventure began. In this British and Soviet-controlled city, we waited to receive our passports. We were all excited by the idea of leaving, especially our friend Marcel Lefebvre, who was very enthusiastic. He wrote, a big project has just been announced. I will maybe take part in an expedition to the USSR with Durand and Albert, and if it comes off, that's all my dreams come true, to go and fly for the great republic, to fight under the banner of humanity. My mother had seven children, my father has always been a laborer. Today I am exiled and sentenced to death by a fascist regime. It would be absurd if I wasn't a soldier fighting for humanity. After 10 long days spent waiting, the Soviets finally issued our new passports. On the 28th of November, 1942, we left Tehran aboard three planes and passed over the Caucasus Mountains. Along with Tula, Derville, Albert and the others, I was heading towards the heart of the war, and if I remember rightly, I was the winner in our game of cards. It was a long journey over this hellish scene, where the Germans were virtually making themselves at home. Six months of fighting had already transformed Stalingrad into a city of ruins and ashes. and my friends and I were headed towards this apocalypse without any trace of fear in our hearts. On the 29th of November, at 4 p.m., we arrived at the Ivanovo Terminus, an airfield 250 kilometers north of Moscow. 
The temperature was below minus 20 degrees when Colonel Shumov welcomed us. Even a short conversation becomes interminably long on a windswept, snowy runway. <laughs> Tovarich and Shapka, the Russian words for comrade and their fur hats with earpieces, or words that warmed our hearts. The Shapka went down very well. Albert asked me if he looked like a bear, and I told him that he looked like a Russian. But our laughter didn't last long. There was nothing in our first experience of Ivanovo to inspire us. The sky and the buildings were equally as grey as each other, and our only horizon was that of a sad white landscape. After our journey of several thousands of kilometres in impossible conditions, we had hoped to find a stop-off point that was a little more welcoming than this training centre. Our first training sessions were the stuff of nightmares, flipping over planes and denting propellers. My first solo flight in my yak brought with it the abrupt realization that we had penetrated a world that we knew nothing about. Ясное дело, что суровые климатические погодные условия зимы давали о себе знать. Летчики к этим условиям, в таких условиях никогда не летали. И особенности выполнения полетов зимой, особенно самое сложное, какие элементы, это взлет и посадка, а особенно посадка. Поэтому были случаи поломки самолетов. И шасси, и поломки винта, да, были случаи, но это нормально. There was one dreary Christmas evening in particular, where poker and vodka looked like they would be our only diversions. But as a surprise, that night we were visited by the writer and journalist Ilya Ehrenborg. He was a friend to France and he spoke our language. Sent by the Red Star, the Soviet Army's newspaper, he brought a gramophone and a record with him as a gift. The record was Parlez-moi d'amour by Lucien Boyer. With the memories of France that this evoked in us, the gramophone and this song would stay with us throughout the war. We didn't know it yet, but for the Soviets, we were already their heroes and had become symbols in their propaganda. That night, Ilya Ehrenborg had already begun writing the legend of Normandy. В дружбе и человеческой сердечности, которая гораздо ближе и понятнее людям, чем торжественное заявление. Здесь дело пролитой на русской земле крови. И Россия никогда не забудет, что эти французы, летчики из Нормандии, пришли сюда. Чтобы вместе с нами защищать Сталинград. After three months of training, at the end of March 1943, we were finally deemed fit for combat. It was Captain Jean Toulin who took command of our squadron. We were just 14 French pilots to be released into a melee of several million men. And that is what Normandy was. Even more than a weapon, it was a symbol. With 11 days already spent at the front, there still hadn't been a single German to get stuck into. Raymond, who at 28 years old was one of the oldest members of the group, spent the time playing his guitar. It was on the 5th of April, 1943, with the first light of dawn. It was still freezing, but the mechanics had spent the night keeping the motors warm. 
the Green Flare announced our departure. Today's flight was a rather mundane shepherding mission to protect the P-2 bombers. I wasn't part of the mission this time. Preziosi and Duron were ready for takeoff. Un groupe des chasseurs Bosch, direction ouest, hauteur 2000 mètres. Almost straight away, our pals announced to us over the radio that German fighters had declared that they were ready to intercept. At last, we wouldn't be alone in the skies today. Duron told us the story of the first Normandy fight here. We're high up, flying fighter cover over the P-2s to protect them. The Germans pounce on them, but they haven't seen us. Preziosi puts himself on the tail of the first one. He fires a burst of shots 50 meters behind him, and the German plane drops straight out of the sky. It's our first victory, and Preziosi is going wild. Now it's my turn to throw myself into the fray. I shoot the second from three quarters behind. He begins to lose altitude, spitting out black smoke, and he crashes. After 14 days at the front, Normandy had just claimed its first victory, and the return of our two fighter planes was a triumphant one. There was a general sense of relief when we saw our two fighter planes coming back. Preziosi's plane flew a past 200 meters over the ground and executed a perfect rollover. Then it was Duan's turn to do the same maneuver. We couldn't believe our eyes. Two enemy planes had been taken down in the same day. Our first two victories had been notched up on the board. It was time to celebrate. The waitress placed a bottle of vodka in front of each victor, a ritual that was accompanied by a bonus of a thousand rubles, which we always refused to accept. My personal position on this was very straightforward. I found it absurd to receive money for having killed my fellow man. We were volunteers, not mercenaries. Eight days had passed since these first two victories. Eight long, drawn-out days without a single German in the sky. Finally, on the 13th of April, Captain Toulon decided to send out six yaks to fly. A free hunting mission was on the cards in the sparse de Mansk region, with three patrols of two. Toulon Derville, Duron Poznansky, and Maie Bizion. It was time to show the Soviets what we French were made of. At exactly 3 p.m., we watched Commander Toulon and his teammates fly off towards the German lines. Suddenly, the tinny voice of Duron bursts into the headsets. Watch out, Ryak! Look to your right! Germans! Bandits at one o'clock! The group sideslips them and banks to come and attack from the front. The encounter is inevitable. Michel Chic guides us towards the enemy from the ground by radio. The sky is being ripped apart by deadly bursts of fire from the German flak, but we're ready to go into battle. Our Yak won against the Focke-Wulf 190. 
Short bursts of fire are combined with desperate and drastic maneuvers. It's difficult to aim well amidst this deadly carousel. These dogfights are extremely violent. Derville is the first into action. The enemy is right in his firing line. The shot is unstoppable. Perfect. Now it is Poznansky and Bizion's turn to complete the picture. Three German fighters have already gone down. In the euphoria of victory, André Poznansky allows himself to be taken by surprise. He has forgotten the advice of Marcel Albert. If you want to live a long time and not end up dead, always fly with an eye in the back of your head. Never follow behind a plane that you've hit. Another one will come and shoot you down. Hit! Poznansky's yak goes into a fatal dive. André has not yet reached his 20th birthday. He's the first Normandy pilot to crash on Soviet soil. Derville has disappeared out of the sky as well, and Bizian is already committed. It's proving impossible for him to shake off his pursuer. Toulan, who is covering them, orders Bizian to stick with him and follow him. He tries to get out of there and makes a sharp turn while pulling back on the throttle. Too late. A deadly round of fire sends his yak up in flames. Bizion has realized that the war is over for him. The encounter and the shock barely lasted a few minutes, hardly enough time for one last song. Years later, we would learn that the Germans would find Bizion's semi-charred papers amongst the plane's wreckage. In reprisal, Bizion's family would be arrested in Dieppe in September 1943 and deported towards certain death in the Buchenwald camp. Music, alcohol and cards. For Lefebvre, Marcel, Rousseau, myself and the others, the shock was terrible. Bizion, La Bisse, the little 21-year-old who always blushed when we talked about girls. We would never hear the sound of Derville, the 29-year-old's guitar again, and Poznansky would never celebrate his 22nd birthday. His Russian campaign had been tragically halted, less than one month after it had begun. Three friends taken down, three friends' lives snuffed out. <laughs> Никому пользы не принесут, они поступали по-другому. Или отправлять во Францию, нет такой возможности родителям. После победы, да, это можно сделать. Ну а как в данном случае? Вещи остались какие-то. Поэтому у них была традиция. Вещь на память. Они, вот что осталось, тумбочка, чемодан, сумка. Взяли, достали. Кто желает взять какую вещь? Это память. Таким образом они продлевали память об этом человеке, о своем друге. That sad night we inaugurated a ritual that unfortunately we would repeat numerous times before the end of the war. We called it the bridage, the sharing out of our departed friend's belongings. We thought that he was dead. We had already brevé. That's to say, we shared out his belongings. But Derville was in fact still alive. At the last minute, he'd been able to straighten up his burning yak out of its crazy dive. Almost unconscious following the heavy impact, Raymond painfully recited the lesson that he had learnt at the base. I am a French pilot in the Red Army. He thought that he was heading towards Soviet lines, but instead he was walking into the lion's den. Raymond Dorville.
Nous savons déjà par les écoutes radio que des pilotes français combattent à côté des bolcheviques. Le maréchal Ketel a donné l'ordre. Tout pilote français capturé doit être fusillé comme partisan. The Germans realized very quickly that the French pilots were fighting on the side of the Soviets. For some time, their listening stations had been picking up messages between the pilots in French. In reprisal, Marshal Catel signed an order in May 1943 that was aimed in particular at the French Normandy pilots. It was nothing less than a death sentence for these Frenchmen, considered as maverick soldiers. Marshal Catel would be hung at the end of the Nuremberg trial. Amongst the numerous charges held against him was that of the summary execution of captured Normandy pilots. Emmenez cet homme. Faites ce que vous avez à faire. Les autres de Maréchal Ketel sont les ordres. On the 14th of July, 1943, the whole group gathered in the clearing. The French flag was raised to the top of a jury mast. Commander Toulon uttered sobering words that touched the heart of every one of us. The day before, Litoff, Castoulin, and Drouin had each brought down an enemy plane. The first Normandy reinforcements arrived in the form of eight new pilots, with Pierre Pouillard at the helm. Commander Pouillard had escaped from Indochina to join Free France. He then undertook a long journey via China, India, Africa, the United States, and finally London to enlist, whereupon he headed for Russia to find his old friend Toulon. It was high time for Normandy to receive reinforcements because the new battle that was in store for them promised to be pivotal. A vast number of German tanks were mounting an offensive against the Soviet troops. The Germans had assembled their best units. For the Russians, fate came calling on the morning of the 5th of July, 1943. The operation's code name was Citadel. The Germans were looking to carry on their march towards Moscow in the Korsk area. 8,000 tanks, 30,000 cannons, and 5,000 planes lined up against each other. It was into this Herculean battle that our handful of Normandy pilots launched themselves with fury alongside our Russian comrades. During the course of four days, we went out 112 times, and 17 of our planes were taken down. We flew from dawn till dusk. Led by Toulon, our squadron was up to the task, but the toll was heavy. In the course of one week, six colleagues would be shot down. Albert Litoff, Noel Castoulon, Jean de Tedesco, Adrien Bernavant, Firma Vermeil, and Commander Jean Toulon. General Zakharov said of Toulon that he loved the sky as one loves life. He was a true eagle of the skies. Zakharov had become a general at 34 years old. We were under his command, and we all valued him greatly. Now Pouillard would replace Toulon at the head of our squadron. Nine способных pilots, trained, ready to take the service. Two of them are in hospital. Normandy is losing the personnel staff. I fear, Captain, if things go on further, my division will not be left with anyone. I beg very strongly, not to achieve any flight without my personal permission. Let's go to the pilots. Let's go to the pilots. Вольно. Товарищи, подразделение понесло первые потери. Некоторые из вас в 
бою рвутся действовать на собственное усмотрение. Отрываются от остальных. Идут на необоснованный риск. Сколь благородны не было бы такие подходы, это не может и не будет продолжаться дальше. Ясно? Рисо, выйти из строя. Поломайте это. А теперь вот это. На сказке. У нас есть такая сказка, когда отец учит своих сыновей на венике. Берется веник. Один ломается. Два ломается. Три ломается. Четыре не ломается. На колено не ломается. Если вы так дальше будете воевать, то от вас ничего, никого не останется. С первой группы восемь человек осталось. Поэтому только тактика группового воздушного боя. Удачи, товарищи. Мне всегда казалось, что им плевать на мои приказы. At the end of 1943, it was an exhausted Normandy group that withdrew to Taula for the winter. Despite the first reinforcements who'd arrived in the summer, there were only a handful of survivors. From the original 14 pilots, there were only five of us left. Marcel Albert, Didier Begard, Marcel Lefebvre, Joseph Wissot and myself. Then Pouillard, our commander, finally obtained reinforcements of 52 pilots and our little squadron could be transformed into a regiment. Отважно сражается на советской и германском фронте французская авиационная часть Нормандия. Французским летчиком, награжденным орденами Советского Союза, генерал полковник... On the 15th of February, 1944, General Shimanov awarded me the Order of the Red Banner, along with Lieutenant Colonel Pouillard, Begard, Marcel Albert and Lefebvre. Along with my comrades, I was named a Knight of the Legion of Honor by General Petit. It was an unforgettable moment when de Gaulle's representative put his saber on my friend Albert's shoulder, then on mine, and then embraced us. Lost in the vastness of Russia, we were tired and depressed without any news of our families. There were moments of doubt for us all, even for men of Marcel Lefebvre's caliber, as seen in this letter home. I'm writing to let you know that I'm still in good health. We're working hard here and we are advancing towards Berlin quite quickly. Unfortunately, Durin did not return one morning after having downed 10 enemy planes, and we have no news on him. Bebert is on his 16th mission, and I'm on my 11th. I don't have any news at all from home. It's very hard. On the 28th of May, 1944, Marcel took off for a routine patrol. My poor friend, Marcel Lefebvre, who used to say solemnly to us, we have left our country, France, on its knees. There is no return for us other than a victorious one. But there would be no return for our friend. Suddenly, he sees his fuel pressure fall to zero because of a leak. Covered in fuel and overcome by the fumes, he decides to land as quickly as possible. But when he's just a few meters off the ground, his yak suddenly goes up in flames. It was a human torch that threw himself out of the cockpit. At 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Marcel was evacuated to Moscow. Lieutenant Lefebvre passed away on the 6th of June, 1944, the same day that the Allies landed in his native Normandy. The next day, six of the original group remained, the six Ivanovo survivors to carry the coffin on our shoulders. I find it hard to hold back my tears. We buried Lefebvre at the foot of the obelisk erected in the memory of the soldiers of Napoleon's guard in the Vedenskoy Cemetery for non-nationals located in the heart of Moscow. The 8th of June, 1944, was a day that was not reported in the squadron's journal. At 4 p.m., a Normandy patrol was sent to Rudnia, guided by radio, where some Focke-Wulf 190s had been sighted. 
another Soviet patrol from the 18th Regiment of the Guard was already at the scene. Maurice Charles makes out the Focke-Wulf from far away, recognizable by their radial engine. Almost straight away, Charles locks horns with a German fighter. He shoots at him head on and gets him. The two enemies cross each other at lightning speed. To get back to him and finish him off, Charles makes a tight vertical roll, which would point him in the direction taken by the German. He fires and the strikes hit his target. But he's mistaken and instead fires on a Russian plane, a Lavochin 5, that looks very similar to the German fighter planes. It is Lieutenant Arkhipov from the 18th Regiment who has just been fired on by Maurice Charles. In the excitement, Charles isn't going to give up on his prey. The Russian doesn't look to retaliate, and in the pandemonium of combat, Charles can't hear his messages. There is total confusion. In one maneuver, Charles puts himself into Archipov's slipstream, and a short burst of fire finishes him off. In the madness and violence of combat, where everything takes place in the space of a few minutes, Charles does not realize that he has just taken out one of our side's planes. Virtually at ground level, and almost taking the plane into a stall, Charles shows us his barrel roll. He thought that he would be announcing his first victory to us. The pilot climbed down from his plane with a beaming smile, but the reception he received was a frosty one. A line of hostile and silent Soviet pilots watched him walk past them towards the mess. Charles did not know it, but he had just killed a Soviet who had eight victories under his belt and who was a Normandy ally. Pouillard, the squadron leader, was lined up with the corresponding officer from the Soviets, and the matter caused uproar. Charles would never be the same again after this tragedy. He started volunteering for the worst missions and quickly won 10 victories. One day, he launched an attack on a group of German fighters by himself. It was a suicide mission. A few minutes later, his plane pierced Russian soil. At Lieutenant Archipov's funeral, General Zakharov didn't blame the French pilots. He was a pilot. И хорошим большевиком. Но такова судьба. И тут ничего не поделаешь. Такое бывает. Не будем об этом. Готовы? Вале, бок. Шагом, марш. In July 1944, we took to the skies again to provide cover for the troops while they were crossing the Neiman River on their way to the conquest of East Prussia. We no longer spoke of daring, nor of courage, nor of heroics. We fought for every ounce of sky in the same way that the soldiers on the ground fought for every inch of land. The Germans understood that they had lost the war and they fought with the fury of a terrible despair. We had a run-in with the pilots from the Mulder's squadron. They were said to be invincible and sent to exterminate the French. Monnier, Bassad, Feldzer and Pignon were taken down. My friend Marcel was already celebrating his 22nd victory and the Soviet forces were able to cross the Neiman River. In Moscow, the cannons thundered to celebrate the Neiman victory, and a prikaz arrived for us with a personal order from Stalin. In reward for its bravery, the squadron will take the name of Neiman. We were all proud and agreed that Normandy Neiman sounded good. Normandy, the name of a French province. Neiman, the name of a Russian river. Not bad at all. On the 15th of July, Normandy moved from Dubrovka to get nearer to the front. The pilots were the first to leave. The mechanics and the ground staff would join them later. That day, Maurice de Seine and Biela Zub, the French pilot and his Russian mechanic, two inseparable friends, were to write the legend of Normandy, a story that is still told today throughout Russia. In the spirit of friendship, 
Maurice took Bielazub on board for an uncomfortable journey. There wasn't any space, so there was no way that the mechanic could take a parachute on with him. Вместе с Володей приняли решение совместное. Никто его туда не загонял и не приказывал. Это совместное решение. A flight that should have been quick and trouble-free, but the failure of the gas supply alone triggered catastrophe. Maurice de Sen has made his decision. He banks to find the runway and land the plane but the plane is crippled and he is unable to guide the burning vessel. Bielazub has understood that they are going to die and he wants to save his friend and pilot. Ему дают команду Марису Десейну, как положено летчику, покидай самолет. Покидай самолет. Он мне докладывает, что покинуть самолет не могу по той причине, что у меня мой товарищ без парашюта. С парашютом он не мог, и он даже оттуда никак выбраться не мог, и вы и выпрыгнуть не мог. Это однозначно. Он, Марис Десейн, прекрасно понимал, что его боевой товарищ, товарищ Володин, пилозок погиб. That same evening, we buried Maurice de Seine and Vladimir Bielazub side by side. The French aristocrat and the farmer from Volga, united in death and friends forevermore. Maurice aurait pu sauver sa vie, mais il a préféré agir noblement. Puisqu'il devait mourir, je ne lui aurais pas souhaité une mort différente. Tous les jeunes, tous les jeunes, свойственно, et как бы там ни было, какая бы она суровая, какая бы она жестокая ни была. Находило всегда место и в отношениях женщине, и а на войне женщины тоже воевали. В основном в обеспечении, понятно, что были летчицы, которые очень красиво сказано, как они сами сказали, красивые летчики, как французы сказали, если бы я смог все цветы мира собрать, то я бы положил к вашим ногам, и этого было бы мало. One day, a squadron of biplanes of PO2s landed at the Dubrovka base. I was very surprised when I saw that the pilots of these old bangers were women, and what's more, they were beautiful. The Germans gave them the nickname Night Witches. That evening, passing above our ground, they threw out a woolen puppet that they had knitted in French colors. It touched me in the same way as a goodbye kiss. At dawn, aboard their PO2s, they headed for enemy lines. They flew hedge-hopping so as not to be spotted. When they arrived close to the target, they cut their motors and glided down to drop their bombs. By the time that the Germans heard the whistling of the bombs, it was already too late. But their planes were slow and vulnerable, meaning that only a few of them survived their mission. The Germans detested these witches, that harassed them every night, and so they were merciless if they managed to capture one of their charming crew. Then there was a love story that ended badly. The journal, Marche de Normandie, 
recounts the event in just a few lines. That afternoon, Nina, the group's secretary, committed suicide. She was 21 years old. В моей смерти никого не винить. Я его очень любила. Я слишком сильно его любила. Нина. The love story between Nina and my friend Albert lasted for several months. Everyone from the Normandy lads to the Russian pilots had their eyes on the beautiful Nina. The political commissar also had his eyes on her, but Nina only had eyes for her Albert. Albert would carry a photo of Nina with him for the rest of his life. He is sure that she did not commit suicide, but instead that she was killed. A crime of jealousy, a political execution, or really a suicide? Today, I still ask myself that question. Nina was married to Albert at the She hoped that she was on her. Но тут, к несчастью, капитан политруп Вдовин узнал о связи Нины с французским пилотом. Он вызвал ее к себе, был очень зол, угрожал ей серьезными последствиями от НКВД. Мне очень нравилась эта девушка. Я неоднократно предупреждал ее, чтобы она была осторожна. Я говорил ей, не заводи этот роман с французом, побереги себя, не заводи этот роман. Between October and November, Normandy had 103 victories. On the 29th of November, our regiment landed in East Prussia, and it was the pilots that were the first Frenchmen to tread upon German soil. Normandy Neiman had been transformed into a genuine regiment, a force of 60 pilots accompanied by 300 Soviet mechanics. And we had become the stuff of nightmares for the German pilots. On the 2nd of December, General de Gaulle was en route to Moscow. France had reclaimed its place amongst the world's leaders, and it was thanks to the lads of Normandy Neiman. At Moscow's train station, the French general was welcomed with honors that are normally reserved for heads of state. De Gaulle's gamble had paid off. He was invited by Stalin to sign a treaty between France and the USSR, a real diplomatic victory for the French general. In the regiment's diary, the general wrote these few lines. On Russian soil that has been tormented like the French soil by the same enemy, the Normandy regiment, my comrades, support, demonstrate and increase French glory. Moscow, the 9th of December, 1944. Although I had seen him before, I was still impressed by the general. We recognize you as our companions for France's liberation, he said in his deep voice. After the general, it was the Soviets' turn to decorate us with medals. My friend Albert counted 23 victories and myself 16. They nicknamed us the Prolat and the Aristo. We were the aces of Normandy and the first Frenchmen to receive the Order of Heroes of the Soviet Union, a gold star that weighed 32 grams. For Normandy, the war still wasn't over. The Germans were still resisting hard, an energy born out of despair. Georges Henri, who had only arrived three months ago, already had four victories under his belt. Я так за него переживал, ты там осторожней, скорость, скорость, все говорю. Сказал, не беспокойся, я скажу, если перееду, там скажу, если я что надо. On the 12th of April 1945, the last battles were fought at the pocket of Konigsberg. The city was in flames but refused to yield. The German fighters were still vicious and aggressive. Veterans from the prestigious Mulder squadron flew on the front line. These were the last acrobatics of the Nazi predators. A veteran at 25 years old, 
Onli hit a Focke-Wulf 190 piloted by one of the last remaining German aces. It was his fifth victory and would also be his last. It was the squadron's last fight. With his stricken enemy, Henri brought the 263rd victory to the Normandy Neiman Regiment. Henri was proud of his victory and was already thinking of the return home. Having lost his father, he had promised his mother that once the war was over, he would join Air France so that he could finally take care of her. He owed it to her. The war refused to end. There was the whistle of shells. A German regiment was still resisting close to Bladil. Our aerodrome was situated directly in the line of fire of these fanatics who preferred to die than give themselves up. Потом обстрел, прям обстрел начался. Это было днём часов на 12. И вдруг шум гам, что лётчиков расстреляли, лётчики погибли. Я туда бежал. Je tiens le coup. Ne vous inquiétez pas. Je ne veux pas vous plaquer maintenant. Il va être un grand moment de temps sans fils. Il ne уже ничего даже глаза закрыты, ничего я дотронуться, ничего сказать, спросить ничего. И тут же уехали и всё. И до свидания. И потом сообщают, что он умер. Пришёл, остался без лётчика, а уж тут собственно и кончилось. И лётчик последний погиб, то при всём на земле, не в воздухе. Two centuries after Napoleon returned from Russia, the Normandy regiment followed the same route back. Friedland, Bladiel, Eylau, but this time it was as victors that the French were flying over Prussia. Victory was within grasp. We had been fighters, and now we were tourists. The bells of the Kremlin and all the capital's cannons, everything that could ring out and thunder, did so in celebration. That night of the 8th of May, Moscow celebrated victory. The immense international war was over. The USSR had survived, and even better, she had won. It was time to say goodbye and time to go home. Marshal Stalin offered the regiment's 40 Yak 3s to the French as a surprise gift. He addressed this message to General de Gaulle. Normandy will return to its country with its weapons, that's to say, its planes. I consider it a matter of course to leave this regiment with all the materials that it used on the Eastern Front with so much bravery and success. On the 15th of June, 1945, in the field, when we were about to take off for the last time, I hugged my mechanic, Palkov, before pulling across the cockpit window. Then, like all the other pilots, I turned to look at General Zakharov, who, alone in the middle of the field, marked our departure by lowering the flag. There were tears running down his face. In November 1942, there were 14 of us fighter pilots who went to Russia. On the 20th of June 1945, out of this small group of Normandy pioneers, only three of us returned to France. Marcel Albert, Joseph Brisson, and myself, Roland de la Pouille. We arrived in Bourget and flew in formation above the airport, which was full of people. Then we landed for my first homecoming in five long years. 272 victoires officielles. Les noms d'Orel, de Vitebsk, d'Orcha, de Königsberg, tel est le palmarès magnifique de ce régiment de héros. When the ceremony had finished, an elegant lady came over to our happy group. She was looking for her son, 
our pal, Georges Henri. What could we say to her? No one dared to tell this lady that her son Georges was dead and that he would never be landing back in France. Finally, one of us replied, unfortunately, he is in the other squadron, madam, the squadron of shadows. They will fly forever. I think she understood that she would never see her son again. We were 96 pilots who took part in the Normandy campaigns. 43 gave up their lives there, and today they fly in the squadron of shadows. But in total, we took down 273 enemy planes, and Normandy is the most decorated French unit of all time. We were young, and we were the French pilots with the red stars.